uh, at least through verse 21, but even farther uh, in the chapter. But verse 21 is where we begin to conclude a little bit here uh, in regards to this particular verbiage that is used. But I find it very interesting the word song is used in this passage of Scripture. Moses is singing a song or leading in a song. And even though time is fleeting from us, we do want to get into our new material. We've been in Exodus chapter 14 for some time now, verse 19 through the end of the chapter, verse 31. And there's so much to be told in regards to this particular passage, but it kind of leads us and catapults us into Exodus chapter 15. And we mention this all the time, and I, I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but it's so important for us to understand that the chapter headings are not, quote unquote, what we would say inspired within the scripture. They're not preserved. They're inserted so that it's easier for us to find our place to read. So if we were to read the Bible as it was legitimately written all those many moons ago, forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven, uh, it was written like a book. A real legitimate book. Why do you say that? Well, the reason I say that is simply this. Because we go from Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 through 31, reading about the Red Sea, reading about the traditional crossing, reading about Pharaoh and his armies, reading about the chariots, reading about everything breaking down, reading about all of it collapsing, reading about the children of Israel looking back after they're safely on the other side, reading about Pharaoh's army saying, surely the Lord is fighting for these people. We're going to turn around and leave. And finding that God does not give them the opportunity to do that. When the waters fall, when the people are killed, that's when we catapult from verse 31 into chapter 15, where Moses begins to sing a song. You say, Pastor Rich, why is that important? Well, if you give me a few minutes, we'll get to that. And that's what we're going to teach about tonight. We're talking about Moses and the Red Sea. Trusting God in difficult times. So important so important for us to understand that even in the hard times, even in the difficult times, we should be trusting the Lord. As He leads, God always sees, right? That's been kind of our, our, our underlying teaching throughout this whole lesson, uh, at least this section in the notes. And I want you to understand that when God leads you somewhere, look, God sees where you're going. You're not there alone. You're not there by yourself. You're not going through this heartache or this difficulty on your own. No, this difficulty on your own. No, God says, hey, I'm right there with you. I see what you're going through. As I'm leading you through the Red Sea, I'm right there watching everything that's going on and everything that's taking place. It's a great thought. We said, number one, we've got to take note of the cloud. We spend a lot of time, and actually, for those who aren't with us tonight and are actually uh, watching on the YouTube channel, they're actually watching the video where we talked about this in great detail. But we talked about the cloud and how that it was more than what I feel we often give it credit for being. It was more than just a cloud that would lead them during the day and a fire by night. But we realized through the teaching and we realized through the scripture and the teaching of God's word that this cloud was actually whatever it was that the children of Israel needed. God caused the cloud slash fire to be exactly what the children of Israel needed. At one point, Jessica, we see that the cloud transitioned and moves from in front of the children of Israel and actually stations itself between the children of Israel and Pharaoh's army. And the Bible literally describes it to us as on one side being a cloud, but yet on the other side being that fire in creating darkness, creating everything that God's people needed is what that cloud became. God did a special miracle here, and we need not forget it. God is going to be exactly what you need Him to be when you need Him to be that exact thing. Letter A, God's people saw the light. They saw the light. They were able to see what God knew they needed. They needed light. They needed to see. They needed the path to be unfolded for them, if you will. 
God's people saw the light. We talked about this and how that God is always watching, right? Letter B, we said God's enemies saw darkness. As we've already talked about and as we've reviewed, this is from the same cloud. This light and this darkness, this protection, uh, all these things are coming from this same angel of the Lord, if you will, this creation where God says, hey, this is what the people need. This is exactly what I'm going to give them. We talked about the instrument panel uh, and we talked about people who uh, get into an airplane and they're allowed to fly as long as they can see like the picture. They can see the clouds. Uh, they can see what's happening. But can they see and can they guide themselves based on the instrument panel? How many of you heard about the, the two airplanes? Uh, that collided at the air show a week or so ago, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I just recently saw a video of it, and uh, it, it's just amazing to see such destruction and, and what, a, what a terrible accident that was. And don't know how it happened, don't know everything that went on. I'm probably not even smart enough to understand because we talked about automobiles and how hard a time we have with a speedometer and an RPM gauge and a gas hand and a battery voltage meter whatever and you look at all this stuff and all these pilots are looking at and uh, what a tragedy that took place there and, and don't forget this the people who saw that happen yeah. uh, that has an effect on people as well so pray for the families pray for those people involved and pray for future events like that uh, but a lot of training goes into what we call instrument training and we talked in great detail about this because there are people who are very very good at flying when they can't see a thing. Not anything at all. All they can see is the instrument panel. And they fly based on what they see on the instrument panel. They can't see out the window, it's dark, whatever. And they use that. You know, sometimes as we travel, sometimes as we work uh, to, to live the life of a Christian, you know, sometimes God refers to His instrument panel of the Scripture. And we may not see down the road. We may not see everything that's happening. But God said, hey, I've created an instrument panel that's in front of you. And all you have to do is follow the instrument panel and you'll get where you're going. What a great thought. What a great teaching. Number two, we saw this, the crossing. Number two, the crossing. When we think of the Red Sea, we have to think of the cloud. We have to see. We have to understand. But we also think of the crossing. What took place the moment Pharaoh raised that rod and he called out to God and God began to part the waters. He began to use the wind in a tremendous way to dry the ground underneath him, to part the waters on either side, and, and to mound it up literally as walls beside them. And we see the crossing in that particular passage of Scripture, letter A, we see that God's people had safety. God's people had safety. When we see what is taking place here, we see the safety that God provided in that crossing. God's people being allowed to travel safely. But then letter B, God's enemies had calamity. They didn't have the safety. They didn't have the positivity, if you will. Their, their end was not a positive one. God had other plans for them, uh, and God caused different things to happen as the enemies of God saw tremendous calamity. And uh, when we talked about this, uh, we talked about this particular battle. We talked about Dunkirk, how that there was no way out. There was no way for them to move. They were literally at a dead end, just like the children of Israel, just like like Moses, just like the people of God. And yet, even though God did not choose to part the waters, uh, God created a way out for them, right? And God took care of them. God did some great things. Look, don't ever think that just because you read something in the Scripture, that that's something that happened once upon a time and that it's never going to happen again. Don't think that God has a special way of delivering us, a special way of taking care of us, and He will do that. He will take care of His own for sure. Number three, tonight, new material, we see the conclusion. The conclusion. Not of the entire story, but of this story of the Red Sea. What is the conclusion? What is it that we see from these passages of Scripture, if you will? 
It was at this juncture that God made a way when there seemed to be no way. He often has done this through the ages. God uses man. God uses his tool to accomplish his purpose. As Moses obeyed God and stretched out the rod that God spoke to him about, God brought the mighty wind. The waters receded on both sides, leaving a pathway of dry ground through the middle of the sea. It was nonetheless a miracle of God. And suddenly those who had doubted now had hearts filled with, watch this, the key word, rejoicing. That's what we find in Exodus chapter 15. That's what we find in the singing and the song that is mentioned here. Uh, in Exodus 15, we find a people who are rejoicing. I often look around and see who is singing. I often look around and who is singing from the belly. Where they want to just really belt it out there, right? You look and you see who's really into it and who's not. It's something that happens a lot at the mission. And I always would mention this to you. Others of you have been to the mission. I almost, I almost always poke at the men at the mission about their singing. Why? Because the ones who sing, they really sing. And then there are some who think that it's a stretching exercise. And they just stand up and they move around and they don't sing. And I often ask them how they expect to get anything from the preaching. Well, the singing has nothing to do with the preaching. The singing has everything to do with the preaching. The singing prepares your heart for the preaching of God's Word. If you're not willing to sing, if you're not willing to be a part, if you're not willing to get involved, guess what? You're not going to be interested in the preaching either. This singing that took place in Exodus chapter 15 is part of the conclusion of the story because God did a tremendous thing and Moses and the children of Israel celebrated through song. They were rejoicing. They were singing. Let's look at it again. Exodus chapter 15, verse number 1. Then watch it. Read that next word. Then what? Sang Moses and the children of Israel. This what? Read it. Song. Do you have it open? Exodus chapter 15. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. Look, they were rejoicing. They were singing. The reason was God had just delivered them. Pastor Edge, is this the end? It's not really the end, but it is the conclusion of the story. And the conclusion is that because of what God had done previously in walking and crossing the Red Sea, Moses and the children of God saw fit. To praise God. They saw fit to worship God. They saw fit to lift their voices. They saw fit, as the psalmist reminds us, to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It's so amazing to see, letter A, God's people rejoiced. God's people rejoiced. And literally, what had happened here was an amazing thing. Because what happened is the people of God saw what God had done for them. And in response to God's victory, Moses and the children of Israel sang praises unto their God. The song is Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 all the way down through 21. Great passage of scripture. I would encourage you to read it. Time does not permit us to turn to all these passages, but I think if you will look in your notes, I think you will find uh, these verses are listed for you. And so I would encourage you to put an asterisk around them, beside them, something like that, parentheses around them. Hebrews 13 and verse number 15, by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. I find that word continually to be a point of interest within this verse of scripture. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Ephesians 5 and 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Very familiar to us, right? That's a great verse of Scripture. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 16, let the words of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. 
What great verses of Scripture. God's people rejoice. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse number 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. The most important result of this great victory was far more than an escape from an enemy. It was a work that God had begun to do in the hearts of the people. It was Solomon who had advised in Ecclesiastes that we must see the whole, the whole of the matter. We must see everything that's going on. We must assess. They, like we do, soon forgot the goodness and the power of God. God, however, wants us to remember. He wants us to remember His goodness. He wants us to remember His mercy. He wants us to remember the blessings that have been established. And again, as we close or we conclude within this particular section in the notes, we open up a new section in the notes and we're excited about the direction that we're going. But don't forget, they erected and they built uh, all these things later on to try to help to remember, to be constantly or continually reminded of what God had done for them. Why do you think it was so important at the latter stages of the children of Israel journeying through the wilderness that God would say, don't forget. Don't forget. Don't forget. What well, I mean at these stones? That was the Red Sea. Right? The Red Sea, the Red sea is the beginning of the story. What well, I mean at these stones? That's the end of the story. Why do you think? I think it's pretty simple to see. They weren't remembering. They were forgetting what God had done for them. They were forgetting what God had done and what He had taken care of, the miracles that He had performed, the things that He did to make sure that they were able to cross the, the wilderness and cross the Red Sea and, and cross into the land of promise. All of these things, God said, hey, let me help you. And hey, they started rejoicing. They started excited. They started singing. They started on top side. They started positive. They started, look, you can add any word in there you want to as a descriptive word. But it's important for us to see that God's people rejoice and they rejoice because of what God did for them. But how quickly we forget. How soon we turn from God's blessings and we forget what God has done for us. Our attitudes change. Our body language change. Our mannerisms change. We become self-indulged people who look at ourselves and say, hey, we're the cause of this. We're the reason for this. But that's not what happened initially. God's people rejoiced because God's people realized that just like the Battle of Dunkirk, they couldn't have done it by themselves. They had to have His help. They had to have His strength. God's people rejoiced. Let her be. God's enemies mourned. God's enemies mourned. We would be wise to take time on a daily basis to think about and appreciate what God has done for us to do this. Creating a spirit of gratitude, a spirit of contentment in what God has done. Thankfulness, if you will, will always lead us to a life that is thankful. But God's enemies did not have that same response. You see, God's enemies mourned. The mourning among God's enemies started with the death of the firstborn. You remember that? We didn't touch on it a lot because it's often touched on so much, but we did just kind of briefly touch on it as we moved along. Don't forget about that. The Egyptian families losing children, but now the mothers and the wives and the sisters and the daughters are now mourning. They mourn the loss of their little ones, and now they mourn the loss of their, their best, if you will, their husbands, the breadwinners, the people who were the strongest of manhood of Egyptians uh, is being lost and being taken away. One can only imagine the sorrow that blanketed the land. I think sometimes we look at this as separate entities, separate events that took place, but we need to be mindful this, this, this is one event that happened. 
Moses is looking to lead the children of Israel out. Pharaoh says, no, plague comes. Plague comes, plague comes, plague comes. Finally, Pharaoh says, okay, you can leave and you can worship. But he changed his mind. You understand? All of this taking place nearly at the same time. In the same time frame. And now not only losing the little ones, but now losing the warriors, the strongest, the army, the military of Pharaoh. This was the death blow to God's enemies. Egypt is mentioned again as a place from which Israel had been brought out. It is mentioned in Scripture as a place where in their weaker moments Israel pinned after the leeks and the garlics, pine, excuse me, after the leeks and the garlics, but the nation was no longer referred to again as a moral threat to the Israelites. Do you ever think about that as you read the Scripture? It's almost as if the story of the Red Sea was the conclusion because, as it were, it was the end of the Egyptians being a perennial power. Why? I happen to think it's because of the attitude that Pharaoh had. Repeatedly asked, repeatedly requested that the children of Israel be allowed to leave, and each time he referred and said, absolutely not. Exodus 12, 30, and Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Exodus 14 and verse 28, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. God has always eventually broken the power of those who oppress his people. God promises to preserve his people. He has never broken that promise before, and I don't anticipate that he'll break it again. They have suffered greatly many times for their own unbelief and sin, but they have never been completely forsaken. Romans 11, verse number 29, for the gifts and calling of God are without by way of our conclusion tonight, I want to reiterate this same thought. No matter how difficult it may be, let's not forget, as the Lord leads us along, the Lord sees all the world. He understands what you're doing. He understands your experiences. He understands how difficult it may be. Don't ever think that he's not there with you. Shall we pray, dear Jesus?